shut up and sit down fans. Spring is here and so is Imperial Settlers, a beautiful game we've got for you today. Hmm. Hello. I've got a board game for you. It's very good and it's called Nations. This is a game where you develop a civilization. You draft cute little building cards and set your little people to work in them. In the game of the board game that is Nations, you develop a civilization, you buy cards for the tableau in front of you and then set your citizens to work in those cards. It's a game of very delicate resource management with just a sousson of fighting to deny your friends what they need. It's a game of managing resource income and expenditure with some rules for war so that you may hamper your friends. And every card, every board, every token is covered in painstaking, absolutely beautiful, cute little art. And the cover has this rather lovely illustration of Marie Curie. She's everywhere you look, really. She's on the main board and on all of the decks of cards and the box, and the manual. Oh, Mary. Mm. Imperial Settlers is, and I don't use this word lightly, joyous from when you look at the cover and see this guy who may or may not be high as a kite setting off to work, to when you open the box and you see all the lovely components and the little people talking on the inlay from when you look through the manual, which is nice, beautifully laid out, very simple to learn, to when you invite your friends over and ask if they want to play a game of running a cute little barbarian tribe. Okay, we're each playing a nation of tiny, cute little people and we're trying to build a big, big city. This is your personal player board, this is your emperor, and you can flip it if you want a male or female emperor, which is nice. You're playing the Egyptians, and so I definitely recommend not using the Ramses looking dude, but flip it to the other side, because the female Egyptian emperor is awesome. She looks like she fell asleep under a sunbed and that she probably should never have left Norwich. This is a deck of personal cards. We also have our own personal faction deck. Each turn, we're gonna draw one card off the faction deck. We're gonna put a few common cards available. We're each gonna take one, put that into our hand. We're gonna do it again. We're each gonna take one and put it into our hand and then we can build. Common buildings go on the right and special faction buildings go on the left. These buildings are all worth victory points and we'll get some extra victory points along the way. Now let me just cozy up to you for a second. Okay, we can see here you've got a few sources. You've got food and wood and stone. You also have people and swords and shields, but we'll get to them in a bit. You'll have a hand of building cards and then you can pay to build something like this quarry. This is a production building, so you pay a wood and a stone and that increases your income every turn. But production buildings also give you stuff when they're built, so that's nice. You can build features like a nice meeting place. These are permanent buffs and this gives you victory points for every pink building in your empire. But again, this counts so you get a nice victory point. Or you can build action spaces like these lumberjacks. They're okay. You pay the wood for them and then that's a place you can send people to work to get more wood. Then you have your faction specific buildings. You could build this nice pyramid that produces gold and stone. You can pay the stone for that. And faction buildings are great. They're worth more victory points, but they have a cost. You have to trash something from the right side of your board. So you're cutting away your options. And this is what the game is. You can also raise common cards from your hand by using a sword. And then that goes away forever and you never get the chance to build it. But then you get the bonuses. In this case, that was more buildings. And then you can also take faction specific cards uh, and then you can't build it, but you can make a deal and you can pay a food and you make a deal and that permanently increases your production. But again, this is more options you're cutting away. Imperial Settlers plays like you're some master seamstress tasked with making an utterly beautiful dress out of the clothes on your own back. You're watching your friends wrestling out of their jackets and ripping apart their clothes to stitch together new fibers. And it's kind of magical and scary all at once. Oh, Miss Curie, you seem to have dropped your Nobel Prize. Why don't you help me pick it up? 
Now, it's not that these two games are the same, far from it. It's more that we seem to review a great new game every week on Shut Up and Sit Down, and these two games are similar enough that owning both would be like living by yourself and having two toilets. Extravagant, not unpleasant, but unsettling on a karmic level. If you do own Imperial Settlers and Nations, why not tweet a picture of yourself looking smug at Shut Up Show and we definitely won't name and shame you. And if you do have two toilets and you live by yourself, can I have one? In Nations, rather than having a hand of cards, we have this austere shop where you can spend your gold to buy such treasures as Satan dressed up as Emperor Augustus or an art student trying to remember how to draw a shadow. You buy these, you put them onto a very limited, interestingly limited, number of spaces on your player board. You can pay stone to socket your citizens onto these, and at the end of the turn you pay food for each of your citizens, and then you're going to get your income based on citizens on buildings of more gold, more stone, more food, and books, which are worth victory points and make up shortfalls of the other resources. So, out of the gate, if that's the heart of this game, Nation seems simpler than Imperial Settlers. Or is it... Ba, ba, ba. No, it's definitely not simpler. Not, no, definitely not. We arrive at this Soviet spreadsheet of a central board. This is where players do their bookkeeping, literally, because the track around the edge is where you keep track of your books. But believe it or not, this is actually the most fun thing about nations, because you've got your books here, and you've got your nation stability track here, and you've got your war track here. But all of the, the numbers that you've got of these things is are irrelevant, right? Because the only thing that matters is your position relative to other players. And that is actually really interesting and a ton of fun. The number of books you have doesn't matter. It's how many other players you have more books than, just like in real life. Your stability is irrelevant. It's only if you have the least stability of all your friends you need to start worrying. And your war, your actual size of your army doesn't matter. It's just that you've got someone you can beat up. And of course, when other players are trying to avoid being in these positions, suddenly you've got this bizarre thing where you get a massive military and all the other players just give up and your massive military suddenly looks ridiculous and so does theirs. This, this is Nations. For all of its battles of Sparta and Spartan artwork, for its classical ages depicted in classic board game beige, commanding a nation in Nations is downright silly. Partially because whenever you buy another great building, you always have to cover up something else, and because each of these things produce two randomly of the like eight different things you can get in this game, you're always totally failing to produce something, which is funny. But mostly Commanding a Nation is absurd because the game just rams the goalposts down your friend's pants, right? In most board games, in most economic engine creation games, the goals are sort of arbitrarily, they're like random numbers that are set at set points, which can be a little tedious. And if they randomize them, it's annoying. But in attaching them to your friends, like, it becomes like weather. It's surprising and interesting and funny, but never annoying. Like, if you think, if you're king of the books and you think you've got all the books and you get lazy, then your friend suddenly produces 20 books in one turn by accident. Like, in a riptide, that's funny. If you miscalculate something and your stability drops down to minus two, that's bad, but then hey, maybe there was some cloud cover in your friend's head and he just dropped down to minus three, saving you. And like I said, yeah, when you get a massive military, you're gonna take the wind out of your friend's sails and their military values will drop to zero. If a game were to do that from the draw of a card, that would be annoying. But your friend's doing it, it makes sense. It immediately makes nations very deep and very rich because there's an amount of second guessing your friends and their capabilities and what they'll want to do. Nations giveth and nations taketh away masterfully. And what I mean by that is, for example, if two people are tied for a reward, neither of them get it. If they're both tied for a penalty, both of them get it. And that actually works really great because equally, nations is incredibly generous in your resource generation. You end up trying to make gold and then you total up your income and you accidentally make a ton of stone and food and victory points and you go, hmm, like I've won the jackpot on this cardboard fruit machine, but I've got this one problem that I just can't plug. It is so much more fun and funnier than the art implies. Funny thing, for all of its use of colour and wonderful cartoonish people and I'll go there, the most fun art I've ever seen in a board game, Imperial Settlers, is actually 
a more mean po-faced game than Nations. Nations does a pretty good job of hiding who's in the lead and you really don't know who's winning. Whereas in Imperial Settlers, you can see as someone's town just spreads. Whereas in like Nations, you just get this absurd generosity, cornucopia of just bleh, just vomits resources at you. In this, each turn, it's like you get another little splash of gasoline in your engine and you're trying to see how you can make it go the furthest. And most importantly, Everyone gets one sword token a turn, but if you manage to get your production such that you have two swords, you can go and burn someone else's area. Just like you can use one to burn one from your hand, except you're burning it from them. And this exchange isn't awful for them. I mean, you obviously get the raise bonus from killing it. They do get a little piece of wood, kind of like to say sorry, and they can still use this building as the foundation to build one of their faction buildings. But still, this mechanic is huge. So Eurogames originated with this kind of conflict being absent. You're able to build an engine and enjoy your friend's company without being forced into direct aggression. Here, no. And frankly, it is a huge relief to be able to have that really smart friend who always wins at these kind of games and go and burn down his house but it cuts both ways while this is a lovely balancing mechanic and of course in three or four player games players can see who's doing well and specifically try and target them now your smartest friend if he has a good engine if he's getting resources but also if he's just getting loads of swords because he's so clever he can go over and take your only source of wood production and flip it face down and get two wood for the privilege knocking you out of the game and slapping your engine over. It's the dictionary definition of a bummer. I don't want to overstate the importance of this raising thing. Let me skip to the end. Spoilers, Shut Up and Sit Down recommends Imperial Settlers, all right? This art is fun. Just drawing a card and seeing what wonderful picture you're gonna get is fun. Continuing this lineage that we have in Shut Up and Sit Down, favorite race for the galaxy is fun, where you're given a handful of fabulous options, but every time you play one, you're probably gonna have to throw away another, that's fun. And stretching out your tiny pool of resources. So you've got three stone and then you build a rubble pile and that gives you another stone that you spend in a stone and a wood, throwing away the rubble pile to build a daimyo, you know, and then maybe just trying to stay in the round a little longer, keeping your two swords back, just in case your friend, just before you, the round finishes, because if you pass, you can't play anymore. You're just hanging in the round in case he burns down your farm. Because then you're going to burn down his village. Because maybe you don't even want to raise anything at all. Maybe you're just being friends. That is fun. But I'll tell you what. Imperial Settlers is a bit more fun if you're winning. And this is interesting. Because this is at odds, just like everything I talked about before, with the art. Actually... This game requires you to be on the ball the whole time. You can't have a bad first turn, because if you have a bad turn one, two, three, four, or five, you'll lose to the player who had consistently decent turns all the way through. It's a very traditional European board game in that sense. And that means that after you've played Imperial Settlers a couple of times, and then you know what kind of a game it is, and you sit down with your friends and you joke and you tell them about the funny Egyptian with the sunburn, you'll also be thinking, stressing slightly, worrying like a horse at a paddock waiting, knowing he's about to go into the race. Because this guy, this guy might seem nice, but he's got no time for ups. When we started playtesting both these games, I could have sworn I was gonna recommend Imperial Settlers Over Nations and I had it all planned out. I was gonna talk about how while on Board Game Geek, Nations is ranked higher than Imperial Settlers. That's because Board Game Geek can have this myopic uh, attitude towards art design. You know, design is praised and they talk about art, but art design, despite being this craft that people can spend their whole lives getting better at, that they can pour blood and sweat and love and hundreds upon hundreds of hours into making a board game a nicer object, it's ignored when it comes to rankings, which doesn't make a great deal of sense. And I was going to say, you know what? Imperial Settlers is a smarter game, but I actually don't know if it is. I think Nations still, despite looking, you know, like it does, and despite having this board, which everyone has to read, but you can't angle both of them towards all of the players, which is really annoying. 
I do still think Nations is smarter. I love so much about it. I love the decisions. I love the randomness. In Imperial Settlers, you can just draw a card that's not very good for your situation. But in this, with the shop, there are always so many cards. And it's so easy to retrofit your empire and, you know, replace your... Let's get that... There you go. Focus, focus, little camera. You can do it. And replace your madrasas with zeppelins. Or replace your bank with a ball court. Everybody outside! What? So the bank is, everybody outside! Go, go, here, take this paddle! It's really funny. I love that you have to make the decision as to whether to expand your empire, removing either, like, giving, saddling yourself with a food debt or a stability debt before you know what the event is that turn. That's really interesting. It's just so strong. And while it doesn't have seductive art, it does have heart. It wants you to play this game for decades to come. There's a whole extra deck of cards you're meant to play with after you've only played a couple of games. There's another deck of cards that the game treats as if it's the radioactive or something and you're only meant to play them when you really know what you're doing. And then the player boards are double-sided with beginner sides and then advanced asymmetrical weird sides. And the main Soviet spreadsheet board has different difficulty settings that change the tiniest, just one rule for each player's. See how many resources you get if you don't grow your population. And that radically changes how hard the game is. So people who are familiar can play it with other people and just enjoy the journey. And they're both struggling together. It's almost, but it's not quite. Nations is almost one of those games where you finish it after two hours and you tot up your victory points and that's a bit tedious. But then you don't really care who wins. But it's not. You, you, do, you do care who wins. But you almost don't. But you do. And it better not be that twat who bought the Battle of Agincourt a thousand years ago and screwed you out of the money you needed to buy Magellan. So, do we recommend nations over Imperial Settlers? Huh? Uh, sorry, I was just buying the first expansion for Imperial Settlers called Why Can't We Be Friends, which adds cards that you're in your town that your friends can then use, but you get the worker. Thing is, Portal had promised some serious post-release support for Imperial Settlers, and I could buy Settlers, this expansion, and I have money left over for a Coke Zero for the price of nations. Although we didn't actually pay for Imperial Settlers, so... Hang on. What is it, oversaturated Quins? I need to buy loads more Coke Zero. Do we need a conclusion to the review? Uh, okay, well, you and I are fussing over extremely fine details because that's what Shut Up and Sit Down does, but... Basically, it's really simple. If you like, you know, uh, world history and you thrill at the idea of swapping, you know, your medieval armies for Renaissance era musketeers, then buy nations. And if you like tiny ninjas, buy imperial settlers. It can't be that simple. It basically is. Bye. No, wait, don't leave. It's so depressing here.